All right. How are we doing? Yeah. All right. Thank you for two of you. How about everybody else? How are we doing? All right. Yeah. If I've not met you yet, my name is Mike. I am one of the pastors here. My wife, Christy, and I are the code lead pastors together. And so excited to be in this Christmas season with you. Uh, I have just a couple of quick announcements if I can. Um, one is the, the same one we share every time. If you haven't downloaded the app, what are you waiting for? That's the question, okay? If you haven't filled out a Connect card in the app to tell us that you're here so we can have your email address, what are you waiting for? Now's the time, right? All right, so if you will do those things, you can find our app by going to, by searching for Smoky Hill Vineyard in the App Store or that other store for that other product I don't use. And you can also find our, on our website, shv.church, okay? So uh, we as a church, uh, every year as we head towards Christmas, we start talking about Convoy of Hope. And so we will talk more about Convoy of Hope the next couple of weeks and even on Christmas Eve. Uh, and as always, we will take an, an offering on Christmas Eve for Convoy and we'll share more about them. Uh, if you do not know what I'm talking about, go back a couple of weeks ago. Christy talked quite a bit about Convoy of Hope as kind of her experience, some of her experiences with them and, and how much we love this ministry. So we'll share more as we get into the next few weeks, but just know it's one of the ways in which we look to kind of see the needs of those around us and those in the rest of the world. Okay. And then lastly, and this is the one that I'm going to get fired by, Chandis, if I don't share. Yes, this is true. He will fire me. We are having Christmas Eve services, okay? So let me be very, very clear. Christmas Eve, Eve, right here. So Saturday night, 5 o'clock, like you always do, right? For those of you joining us online, just know that we will be here Saturday night, 5 o'clock, to do, do Christmas Eve, Eve service. And we, since we are moving into this place by the end of the year where we're going to be one church, many locations, or many rooms, we are saying basically we are doing the same exact service Saturday night here at 5, Sunday morning at Larkspur at 10 a.m., and Sunday night in Larkspur at 5, okay? So you can pick any one of the three. If you decide, hey, I want to go down to Larkspur on Christmas Eve, come on down. You might give us some light looking, okay? But you may say, nope, I want to be here with my peeps on Saturday night then you should do that, right? I know I just aged myself by dropping the word peeps, but that's okay. So anyhow, we just, those are your options. They are available to all. Here's what I will promise you is that we will be at all of them, okay? Okay. By we, I mean Christy and I and Chandice and Trayvon and, and Joan and, and, and Kelly and pretty much everybody else and Greg and, you know, I mean, yeah, so, yeah. But, uh, you know, there we go. All right. So we are in our series, Whatever. Whatever. And if you remember last week, I shared that we are doing two series at once because we are overachievers. And we think we're really, we, anyhow, because Philippians works out really well that as we head into Advent, it has some of the same themes that we see in Advent. And so we are doing both alongside one another. We are not doing them in typical Advent order. So if you're following the Advent calendar, you're probably already aware of the fact that we are out of order because love does not go first. Okay? So we are going out of order because we made it match Philippians. So we had to fix the text in Philippians that kind of worked with the different themes. So this, as we enter into Advent season, one of the things I did not do last week was talk about what is Advent. So if you don't have any history and you just go, well, I know there's mention on Advent, I know it has something to do with Christmas, but I'm not really under sure I understand what it means, let me help you with that, all right? Advent is observed as a time and of expect, expectant, that's a hard word, let me say it again. Let me try that again. Expectant waiting and preparation for Christmas. It's a Latin word, eventus, which means coming. And it's translated to the Greek word perusia. If you don't know what perusia is, it's the same word. It's the word that means the coming back or the return. So as followers of Jesus, we believe the kingdom came at the first perusia event where Jesus came to the earth. And then we look forward to the next event when he will return. So Advent is um, it's not just about remembering the coming of Christ. It's also about looking forward to his return. So as we celebrate Christmas, to quote the other famous theologian, Ricky Bobby, 
It's not just the baby Jesus we're celebrating, but the Jesus who will come back and return and rule and reign. So it's a season where even the idea of an Advent is, is that we remember that God did what he said he was going to do as a way of looking forward to the fulfillment of his promises that he says he's going to do. Okay? The Advent calendar was a practice introduced by the German Lutherans. And it starts the fourth Sunday before December 25th, so we started it last week. All right? And the theme, the scriptures, there's readings, other things along those lines. If you're looking for ways to engage around this, uh, if you download that app that I keep telling you to download, it's got resources and then our resource section. It's got the ability to walk through some sort of devotional time and season of this Advent season. Okay? So last week we did What's Love Got to Do With It? This week, I know, it was so good, wasn't it? Yeah. This week, I couldn't come up with anything super great, so I'm, I'm just going to say it's about hope. Hope. Jesus Christ, our only hope. So, as we think about even the series of Advent, is that we think we look, that with hope, we, so it's really a beautiful expression of even as we look at Advent, because hope also remembers what God did as we look forward expectant with what he's still going to do, all right? So we, or sorry, or me, as I, th- as I think about hope, I-, I cannot but help reflect on some of my, my Christmas, oh, candle, let me do the candle, sorry, I'll light the uh, Advent candle since I am so good at this. So there, there is love from last week, and then we're going to go hope, ta-da, yay, yeah, I know. I know, it's like walking and chewing gum at the same time. It's a miracle. All right. So as I think about hope, I remember as a kid. Can any of you remember that far back when you were a kid in the Christmas hopes and all the things that you've thought about? I'm going to date myself a little bit, but here we go. There was this institution called Sears. They were a department store chain, kids. They existed in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, and then they're gone. But Sears used to have this Sears Roebuck calendar. Our, uh, catalog. And that thing was like this thick. It was like it was like the Atlanta Yellow Pages. Like it was that big. I grew up in the outside of Atlanta, and so I reckon I would put them together and go, "Yeah, we could sit on this. My mom could sit on this in the car too, not just the Yellow Pages." So the Sears Roebuck calendar, or the catalog rather, and I would go through and circle all the things I wanted, and then I would dog ear the pages so my parents would find it. Come to find out years later, they never even looked at that, that catalog. <laughs> Such a waste of time. And the only thing they ever bought me from Sears was, uh, was tough skin jeans because I would wear my jeans out. So. But so I would go to Christmas, right? And you would go sit on a, a Santa Claus knee and at a department store or, I don't know, a county fair or something like that. And I mess up maybe the hardware store or whatever. And you'd be like... You know, in the middle of a mall, hey, Santa, I want these, these, these. And you would never get them. And I would, the Christmas story I related so much to, but I never got my Red Ryder BB gun. So that's my history of hope around Christmas. So I would, I would come away most Christmas mornings, like, disappointed. I know, it's sad. Right now you're, you're feeling sad for little Mikey as a little boy. But I realized that I put my hope in the wrong things as I got older. And if we're honest with ourselves, we put our hopes in the wrong things all the time. If our, our joy or our life and our, our excitement and energy for life comes out of whether or not the Broncos win on a Sunday, well, it's been a good five weeks, six weeks, right? But it doesn't always go that way. If our hopes are in politicians fixing all the world's problems, we're going to be waiting a while. If our hope is on a boss or a company to help take care of my needs, my hope is on a pastor or a church. See, we get mixed up and we see all these places where we put our hope where God never intended us to put our hope. Our hopes reveal our motives. And what we'll find is as you start thinking about what are the things I really hope for, as I say, what's the thing that you're most hopeful about this season? The first thing that comes to mind would probably reveal some of where your heart is. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you start shouting those out from right there. Yeah. Uh, the word hope, is, it, the, word, the Greek version of it is elpis, 
It means to desire with expectation of obtainment and to expect with confidence, which implies trust. And if we look at any of those things I just mentioned in that way, they're going to break our hearts. But God won't. In Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis postulates that the temptations of the devil fall into one of two categories. In other words, the, category, the two categories the devil goes after us with are either A, pride, or B, despair. And... If he can take you down through, if he can't take you down through pride, he will try through despair. In other words, hopelessness. The opposite of hope is despair. This world is losing hope. I found this fantastic, actually, it's a heartbreaking, but this fantastic uh, uh, statistics in this, in this website called Statista, which I was like, they sound really smart because it sounds smart. Statista. And, and they're, they're, as they're looking around and they're actually sharing this from a positive standpoint and going, hey, so most people still have hope, but it's way down from years past. That over the years, this is worldwide, by the way, this is not an American epidemic. These are, by the way, we should go live in Brazil, right? They got it, we're going on. But man, most people are losing hope in this world. They're in places of despair. One of the painful things that we've all walked through is this idea of COVID which really changed the face of our world. And here's what I would say, is that I don't think COVID did as much as we give it credit for. I think what COVID did is revealed all the things that were underneath the surface that have all come rising up. I think people are always wrestling with hopelessness. I think people are always wrestling with anxiety. I think, I think there's a, the depression piece has always been right around the corner. And thank goodness, at least now, we're talking about things like trauma and depression and anxiety in ways that we weren't as a society four years ago. But I, I want to remind you that we have the hope. So as we look at this section around hope, I think, I think Paul speaks to some things around hope. So we're going to pray, we're going to dive in. And I believe that Paul actually gives us a, just a couple verses here that give us a, a, an insight of how to find hope, how to go looking for hope. Okay? So we're going to pray, we're going to dive in, and then we're going to read Philippians 3. All of it. So hold on, we got a ways to go. All right. So Jesus, thank you so much for the hope that you brought the world with your first coming. That as we celebrate Advent, we remember you coming as we look forward to your return. And in this place of this in-between world, God, I pray that you would speak to each and every one of us. And that you would give us your hope. Not human hope, but a Holy Spirit hope. God provided hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so Philippians 3 is a, uh, we're going to read the whole chapter. And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to mix it up for you. We're going to read it all in the message, okay? All right, so for some of you right now are going, but I was going to pull my Bible out. Well, if you've got a phone, you can pull it out and just change the translation of the message. But uh, we're going to read it all, and I'm going to just give you some highlights of things that are going on so I don't just leave you in this place of going, what in the world is Paul talking about? And then I'm really going to focus in on just a few verses that we'll come back to in the NIV and we'll kind of look at, I think it's a, I think it's a picture of Paul giving us a, a road map for how to find hope. Okay? All right, so... Philippians 3, let's start verses 1 through 6 out of the message. And that's about it, friends. So halfway through the whole letter, by the way, he said that's about it. And then he keeps writing. All right. And that's about it, friends. Be glad in God. I don't mind repeating what I've written in earlier letters, and I hope you don't mind hearing it again. Better safe than sorry. So here goes. Steer clear of the barking dogs. Those religious busybodies, all bark and no bite. I know none of you know what I'm talking about there. All they're interested in is appearances, knife-happy knife -happy circumcisers, I call them. The real believers are the ones the Spirit of God leads to work away from at this ministry, filling the air with Christ's praise as we do it. We shouldn't carry this off by our own efforts, and we know it, even though we can list what many might think are impressive credentials. 
You know my pedigree, a legitimate birth, circumcised on the eighth day, an Israelite from the elite tribe of Benjamin, a strict and devout adherent to God's law, a fiery defender of the, for the purity of my religion, even to the point of persecuting the church, a meticulous observer of everything set down in God's law book. All right, let's pause here. Let me give you a little background of what's going on. If you read this in the NIV, he uses the word circumcision, I don't know, about 85 times. It's, it's a little high, but it's not, not exaggerating by much. If you really want to get in this argument around circumcision, go spend some time in Galatians. It's where Paul really goes after this whole argument. But let me give you just an overview of what's happening. Some of you are going, oh, we're talking about circumcision in church? Yeah, they talked about it in the first century in church. We're talking about it, okay? So here you go. Here, here it is. Circumcision became this, for the Jews, was a, was, a, a, was a mark of the difference between being Jew and Gentile. In other words, a non-Jews would not be circumcised. Only the Jews at this point in history were circumcised. What was happening is Paul is going around and doing his missionary journey, and he is leading Gentiles to Christ, and he's helping them find Jesus. These Judaizers, as they're called, the people who would come along, they were Jewish believers, but they would follow Paul into different places and say, hey, you're not really following God if you're not keeping the Old Testament law. And, by the way, all men should be circumcised. So they were putting all this guilt on, on actually asking, not asking, but almost demanding these Gentile men be circumcised to be true followers of Jesus. And then they were saying Paul's not really a real, a real believer. He's not, he doesn't really understand Jewish law. And so Paul's laying out this argument and going, dude, I am like the smartest one of all of you. I am the most Jewish guy there is. I came from this tribe. I studied with this rabbi. I did these things. I even persecuted the church before Jesus came and met me. Nobody defended the law quite like I did. And he is saying, as somebody who has every reason to know all the arguments, they're rubbish, they're trash, they're nonsense. Don't do it. Don't give in to that stuff. And so really what I want you to hear out of this is what he's really saying is one of the things I think is really, really important for you. If you are a follower of Jesus, I want you to hear this very, very clearly. Do not, do not, do not let anyone add things to Jesus. That's all you need. Jesus is it. Jesus makes it very clear in John, 14 when he, or John 15 when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He didn't say except through me and you're circumcised. He didn't say except through me and you wear the right clothes to church. He didn't say except through me and you can quote the, old, the King James Version of Micah, Right? No, don't add things to Jesus. And if somebody's trying to get you to add things to Jesus, they are not looking out for your best interest. It's, it really is. It's all about Jesus, period. Okay? That's really what Paul's saying in this first part of, of uh, Philippians 3. And it's what he says all the way through Galatians. And Galatians is a fantastic, fascinating read. Uh, anyhow, but we don't have time to dive into that. We would be here all night. And I promise to get you out of here by 730. Okay? All right. All right, Philippians 3, starting verse 7. The very credentials these people are waving around as something special, I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash, along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. Compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ, Jesus as my master, Firsthand, everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant dog dung. You get it, right? He's laying out and going, it's all worthless. All those accolades, all those things I had, all those wonderful things people are saying about me, all the, all the awards I won, right? I mean, I wonder how many stickers he got in, in Sunday school for memorizing verses. And All right. I've dumped it all in the trash so I could embrace Christ and be embraced by him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting God, God's righteousness. Beautiful. I gave up all that inferior stuff so that I could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, be a partner in his suffering, and go all the way with him to death itself. 
If there's any other any way to get in on the resurrection from the dead, I wanted to do it. Right, really, he should have stopped right here. This is a mic drop moment. This is beautiful language. So remember, he Paul's in prison. He thinks he's going to die at any moment, and he's making the statement like, "I know that I will be with Christ in eternity because of my life with Him." And it's not about following rules. It's not about checking all the boxes. It's not about doing all the things everybody thinks you should do. It's about life with Jesus, and that's it alone. Boom. So good, right? We cannot act righteous. Only God can give that through Jesus. You cannot do it on your own. You will never be righteous enough on your own. And Jesus made a way so we don't have to. This is so good. So let's just pause here real quick. I don't know where you are on your journey of faith. Maybe you're in a place where you've not said yes to following Jesus yet. I just want to make the invitation like right now. Like this, this is it. This is what, what Paul's inviting us into is a life called freedom. Where we don't have to wonder whether our, our next sin is going to put us and damn us to hell forever. We can live a life of freedom. And it's not about keeping all the laws. It's not about keeping all the rules. It's about a relationship with Jesus. So if you've never done that, let's take just 20 seconds. Let's do it right now. The prayer is really simple. It's, I need your help, Jesus. I cannot do this on my own. Please forgive me for the ways I've tried to do it on my own, the way I've tried to, to make my own life work. And would you come into my life and bring that freedom that weird guy Mike keeps talking about? And I receive your love. I receive your kindness. I receive your grace. That's it. If that's you, take the time to do that right now because I want to promise you this is what Jesus offers. It's a life of freedom. It's not about rules. It's about life. All right, moving on. Verse 12. If you're in that place, I want to encourage you that if you've just even prayed that for the first time, please let us know. If you're in the room, please let me or, or Christy or Chandis or Joan or, or Trayvon or somebody know before you leave. And if you're joining us online, please communicate with us. You don't have to post it in the comments, but you're welcome to. But even just a message to us, let us know so we can be praying with you, okay? All right, Philippians 3.12, Paul goes on. I'm not saying that I have all this, this all together, that I've made it. But I am well on my way, reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this. But I've got my eye on the goal, where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running, and I'm not turning back. Beautiful, beautiful. I, we're going to come back to this text. I think this text is the, the, the doorway to our kind of conversation around hope in just a moment, but even more. But... I just want to say this, this language is all about hope. He doesn't use the word hope here anywhere, but it's all about hope. And he's reminding us that we're all in a process. It goes back to what we talked about last week. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We are in process. We are in process. And he's moving forward, not backwards. It's about hope. Okay? All right, verse 15, and we're going to go to the end now. So let's keep focused on that goal. Those of us who want everything God has for us, if any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it yet. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. Stick with me, friends. Keep track of those you see running the same course, headed for the same goal. There are many out there taking other paths, choosing other goals, and trying to get you to go along with them. I've warned you of them many times, sadly, and I'm having to do it again. All they want is the easy street. They hate Christ's cross. But easy street is a dead-end street. Those who live there make their bellies their gods. Belches are their praise. All they can think of is their appetites. So there's far more to life for us. We're citizens on high heaven. We're waiting the arrival of the Savior, the Master, Jesus Christ, who will transform our earthly bodies into glorious bodies like his own. 
He will make us beautiful and whole with the same powerful skill by which he's putting everything as it should be under and around him. Man, that's fun, isn't it? Yeah, it's good stuff. Some of you right now are going, but what's this thing about belching and bellies and appetites? All right. So Paul is making the point here that there are lots of people that are going to try to steer you out of this life. There are going to be be temptations everywhere you go. Did you know that people who don't follow Jesus try to get you to follow what they're doing? Really? You knew that already. All right, I'm sorry. I don't need to be here. So, But we have that place, right, where we are around people all the time who don't know Jesus, or they pretend like they do, or they say some of the right stuff at the right moments, but then they're trying to pull us off in all these weird different tangents. Paul's saying, stay the course. Stay locked in. Stay focused. Don't let all that other stuff, like, confuse you or pull you out. Then he does this whole thing around they fill their bellies. Well, So this really, remember, this is the first century world where everything, food is everything. Like, so people didn't think in terms of material wealth in the same kind of way we do. They thought in terms of, do you have enough food for tomorrow? Do you have enough food for next week? Most people had just enough to get their food for today. So this idea of people who could eat so much that they would stuff themselves and get so full was almost offensive to the rest of society. It was this very selfish kind of attitude and response. So that's what Paul's using as an example here. He's making the point, you, you've been around those people, right? He's telling us, he's saying to people of Philippi, don't be around those kind of folks. They're in it for themselves. They're only looking out for themselves. And then, and then there's more to this life. We're citizens of high heaven. What he's talking about here is this, this beautiful idea of citizenship. So for everybody that he's writing to, they would have understood this in a different context than even we do. For most of us, we'd say, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm a citizen of the United States, or I'm a citizen, I'm a dual citizen of this country and that country, or what have you. And so, but we don't think about our citizenship in the same kind of way that they did in the first century. Because we just go, well, that, okay, it's just what I am. It's where I live, right? And let, until you travel and you start getting into passport lines, you don't really think about where you're a citizen of most of the time. But for the first century world, citizenship was a big, big, big deal. So the Jews saw themselves as citizens of Judaism. And even though Roman had occupied them, they refused to be Roman citizens. Did you know this? So Paul's pretty unique because he is one of the few Roman citizens we see as a part of this early church, or at least a part of the early Jewish church. So most of like Paul and, I'm sorry, Peter and and James and John and Jesus and and those guys were not citizens of Rome. They were allowed to be their own Jewish citizenship, which is why we had a king of Israel, even though he was under the Roman Empire. So that's why Herod was king, even under Caesar Augustus. Okay? Fascinating stuff, right? So for most of the world, though, that was in Rome and under Roman rule is that when they were conquered by Rome, they became, they had a right to, to establish themselves as Roman citizens. And so they wanted to take on the rights of Roman citizens because it meant that then they, were, they had rights to the legal system and to the courts. And they couldn't just be, uh, uh, they couldn't just be accused and, and killed because they weren't citizens. There was actually a process. So Paul's a citizen. We know this from some of other Paul's writings. Actually, why he's in, in Rome is because he was a citizen. He actually, he actually appealed to the higher authority all the way up to Rome. So they sent him to Rome to be judged. But to be a citizen most times meant you had to pay for it. All right? So that's this thing. And then what Paul's saying is, no, no, no. Don't count your citizen as a Jew. Don't count your citizenship as a Roman. Count your citizenship in God's kingdom. It's something way better. Way better. And being a citizen in God's kingdom trumps all of this other stuff. And don't get confused about whose citizen you really are. Where is your allegiance is what he's really asking. It's the question he's really asking. All right? All right, so let's go back. Let's go back to the model to find hope. All right? So I want to go back to Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Um, by the way, there's so much more on Philippians 3 we could have gone through. We just don't have the time. So let's, let's go back and let's really focus in on the hope piece out of this. Right? So Philippians 3, 12 through 14 out of the NIV. 
Um, now, not that I have already obtained this, Paul's writing, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet having taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All right, so let's start and work our way backwards a little bit. The prize is Jesus. The prize is Jesus. What Paul's writing about, this goal, is what he's trying to obtain. He's talking about this life where he's with Jesus for eternity. And so going back to what Greg talked about a few weeks ago, where he says, to live as Christ, to die as gain. He's saying this, this, it's this invitation of going, yes, I know that I may be physically killed on this earth, but it's actually for my good. I know that I will be with Jesus forever. And if I stay here, then what I'm doing is I'm living out what Christ asked me to do on this earth. So it's a both and proposition for him. So he's, he's giving this picture of going, my goal is to have an eternity with Christ. That is the goal of which I'm striving for. But I believe this whole text actually speaks to this model, find hope. He's pro, he reminds us he's still in this process of working out his salvation. He says, I haven't obtained it yet. I don't consider that I've taken a hold of it yet. He keeps pressing on. And then the key verse, I think, is the part that's forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I think this is a model for hope, to find hope anyways. Forget what behind. There's so many references in Scripture about not looking back. There's lots of prophecies out of Isaiah and Jeremiah that say, you know, you will not remember the former days. You'll step into something new, right? And, and then there's the story of Lot and his family and Moses leading the Jews out of Egypt. There's a number of stories where God clearly tells the people, don't go back. Look forward. Don't go back. But the strain towards what ahead is, if I could give you, give me just a minute, let's go a little deeper in this. The word strain in the Greek is better translated as stretching forward or reaching forward. So it doesn't mean strain like, yeah, when I work out, I got a strain. And a muscle strain. No, it means, it means actively reaching and moving and going forward. So it's a, it's a stretch. It's a constant reaching out. It's a constant. It's not a, okay, I stretched for a little while, now I've stopped. Well, I reached out. No, it's not a past tense. It's a constant forward tense. Present future, I think, is what it is. I'm not an English teacher, but I think that's the right word. It's a present future tense. So he's talking about this idea of reaching out. And then this word ahead means before or in front of you. And it means it can mean both place and time. It can mean either or. So what he's really saying is forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to the kingdom complete. This is his invitation. This is what he hopes for. This is what he's inviting us to join him in is this idea of a hope that means that I let go of the past and I am constantly reaching for Jesus and the fulfillment fulfillment of his kingdom. Remember, we've talked about the kingdom of God came with Jesus. It's continuing to come and break into this world as people say yes to following him. It also goes with you and I as citizens of his kingdom. Paul describes the word citizen right there. You and I as citizens of his kingdom, we take the kingdom with us everywhere we go. When Jesus says you will do these works and greater, he's talking about you and I. Walking in life with Jesus, being representatives of God everywhere we go. We talked about this last week, right? We're made to reflect God's image to this world. And the kingdom was not complete until Jesus returns. And there will be a day when it will be complete. For most of us, we will not see that day. We will go and be with Jesus, and then it will be complete for us. But that's what it looks like. All right, so finding hope. I have three things for you, or two things here for you. Finding hope through, one, forgetting and remembering. Forgetting and remembering. You're like, what? Mike, that makes no sense. All right, let me explain. Forget what you and others have done to you. 
Finding hope through forgetting and remembering. So the forgetting part, I want you to forget what Paul's inviting us into is this picture of forgetting what you and others have done to you. So we'll start with the others. Man, forgiveness is so necessary, right? People, it turns out, treat you badly sometimes. Turns out, I treat people badly sometimes. Turns out, I have to ask for forgiveness. I'm sure all of you have never had that problem, but I have that problem all the time. I've had it today, okay? I constantly have to ask for forgiveness. Sometimes I don't treat people very well. I know this about me, and so I'm constantly, and sometimes I'm more self-aware than others. I'm just going to say this. We hurt people, and oftentimes hurting people hurt people really badly. But our role is not to, it doesn't mean we just lay down and take it. I'm not saying you shouldn't set boundaries. If somebody's continually hurting you, you should get out of that relationship and not be in a relationship. But you still have to forgive. And I think there's a part of that that you can actually forget. For those of you who remember some of my past and some of my story, I like to bring it up every now and then, not because I live in it, but because it's a good reminder of what God's done. But I went through a divorce 23 years ago, 22 years ago. And in going through that divorce, I thought for sure I would never be remarried. And when, Christy, when God brought Christy and I together, which can only be described as God, my favorite story is laugh out loud funny. But when God brought us together, because, I mean, why would she marry me? It's got to be funny, right? It's, it's funny. So, so when God brought us together, uh, one of the things that we prayed for, I had been married before. So I prayed that God would actually remove all of my memories of my past life so that I could fully be connected to my wife. And you know what? The truth is they're gone. Now, I'm sure if I spent some time, I could pull them back up, but I don't. Why go there? God's done me this incredible, remarkable miracle in my own memory and allowed me to step forward completely into now and letting go of the past. So there's an invitation here, the forgetting piece, where God wants to invite you to forget and forgive, by the way. You can't forget without forgiving. And so here's the other part is I think many of us are better at forgiving others than we are forgiving ourselves. That we get in these places where we, we keep beating ourselves up over past moments. We let the enemy come in and keep asking the question, are you sure that one's really forgiven? Maybe that one's not, Right? Erwin McManus, in his book, Wide Awake, has one of the most remarkable quotes, and I've carried it with me for 20 years. And the quote is this, you're not defined by your worst moment. See, the enemy wants to come with shame and convince you that your worst moment's who you really are. God doesn't define you that way. You're not defined by your worst moment. Can you forgive yourself? Because if you can't, you cannot embrace this hope that Jesus offers us. You have to forgive others and yourself. By the way, I don't know if you noticed this, but this ties in last week to the greatest commandment, right? Love others, love yourself. All right. The second part of the, the forgetting and remembering is that we remember. We remember what God has done for you. So I think one of the best verses of all Scripture when it comes to hope and even remembering is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. This is a really powerful verse. And for many of us, we've, we've written these words on our walls. We've written them in our Bibles. We've written them in letters of encouragement. We even have signs in our homes that have these verses up there. But did you know that this is actually a moment where Jeremiah is correcting bad prophecy? That somebody else has come along and tried to tell the people of Israel, no, 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 Jeremiah doesn't know what he's talking about. God's not going to have you in, in, uh, in slavery or, or in, in, in Babylon for that long. He's actually got a plan for you to be out sooner. And Jeremiah is like, that is not true. That is not what God says. And it's actually this in the middle of this text in this middle of this moment where Jeremiah says, you're going to spend 70 years in captivity. 70. We can't wait seven minutes. 70 years in captivity. It's coming. This is what God has said is going to happen. But I know the plans I have for you. 
In the midst of that, Jeremiah is sharing a message of hope in the midst of a really heartbreaking prophetic truth. They're going to be in captivity for seven years. If God knew the people of Israel needed that kind of encouragement, aren't we thankful that he sent Jesus that we can go to at any moment and ask for his hope? So this moment of even looking back at Jeremiah 29, 11 is a moment for us to go, we saw God promised he was going to do something, and by the way, he did it. He did it. The Old Testament points to Jesus, and he did it. He did everything he said he was going to do. So we remember that God is good. We forget ourselves and others when it comes to the hurts, and we remember God. God is good. God's plans for you are good, to give you a hope and a future. That is his desire for you. All right, so finding hope, the second part of this, finding hope through reaching forward towards the kingdom complete. Remember that section we just read out of Philippians 3, verse 13. Straining towards, right, straining but the reaching forward to this kingdom complete, to this moment when the kingdom will be complete. See, we look back and remember what God has done, forgetting our own stuff, and then we reach forward constantly to Jesus, to what he's doing. And the kingdom is not complete, but we reach forward in this in-between place, this now and not yet the kingdom where we keep going forward. Okay, Jesus, more. What do you have for today? Okay, Jesus, what do you have for my neighbor? Okay, Jesus, what do you have for my family? Okay, Jesus, what do you have for my kids? What do you have for my coworker? What do you have for my friends? What does it look like for me to be reaching for your kingdom in all these moments? When Jesus returns, he'll put everything right as God intended it. And it's the goal we'll never reach the side of heaven, but we keep straining towards it. And this is where our American mindset gets us in so much trouble. Not just the waiting part, by the way, because we suck at that, right? We also suck at the process and the journey. We want the goal so bad, we don't even care how we get there sometimes. And for Jesus, it doesn't work that way. It's always the journey. The journey is the goal. The journey is the goal. The transforming thing that happens in the journey, the life together with others, the rubbing against one another in ways that cause sparks sometimes, that is the goal, that we are being transformed. And it's not just obedience, by the way. Sometimes we think of things in obedience. It's more than that. It's submission. Saying, God, not my will, but yours. Not just because you command it, but because I'm submitted to you. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 through 20. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. Paul's reminding us there's going to come a day when we are going to be redeemed and resurrected and with our Savior for eternity. It is something to look forward to. It's a future hope. Hope says stop focusing on yourself and your circumstances and focus on God. And a despairing heart finds a problem with every opportunity. A hopeful heart finds opportunity in every problem. God, what are you doing in this moment? And a hopeful heart is confident that God will act and actually expects God to act. And then lastly, hope is a choice, not an emotion, as we think about this idea of of leaking forward. So, Jesus Christ, our only hope. The title of this message comes from the verse 1 Peter 3.15. You must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Maybe I shouldn't have done this, but this is a very tender phrase for me. It's a very tender scripture. I used to mock my dad over this 
phrase, not the phrase itself, but the fact that when he retired, he created business cards that said, Jesus Christ, our only hope. It would have his name, his phone number, his email address, and it would say, Jesus Christ, our only hope. 1 Peter 3.15. My dad died four years ago. And I just, the, watching him, like, as he was going through pancreatic cancer, and it's clear he's dying, and he's in this beautiful place in between our world and the next. There were so many moments you would sit in a room with him. And he'd be talking to Jesus. And it was so present. It was so real. It's the most spiritual thing I've ever experienced. Being in this place where it's literally the world's colliding and the the veil is very thin. All the years of study, all the years of my experiences with God, all the years of seeing God respond to prayer and, and to bring miracles, all those years were nothing compared to that moment. All those years of wondering, boy, I'm sure I'm putting all my eggs in one basket, Jesus. I hope this is right. And then sitting in that moment and going, it is real. Trayvon, if you and the team could come back up. This is the hope that Jesus is inviting you into. This is the invitation, is to step into this kind of hope that means that, that we, we don't have to see all the circumstances, all the world around us. We can know that God's in charge. He's in control. And by the way, it doesn't mean I don't miss my dad. I miss him so much. So what is God inviting you into right now? What are you holding on to of your past that he's saying it's time for you to let go of that? What are you, what are you still processing with when it comes to this place of, of even forgiving others? Is there forgiveness things that you've got to let go of with somebody else that's really hurt you deeply? If you ask God to remind you of moments where he has worked on your behalf and helped you remember these places where he has done what he said he was going to do, He's taking care of you. Or are you somebody right now who just needs a touch of God's spirit that says, it's going to be okay. I got this. Look and strain forward to what I'm doing. Come partner with me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. So can we all stand? What I want to encourage you as, you as you maybe pray about one of these things, maybe you take one of these things to the Lord, we have people that would be glad to pray with you. They'll kind of make their sways around the outsides. And they're just they're a part of our prayer team. And what it just means is they're trained to like just sit with you in prayer. And even if you just want somebody to sit with you and just be present with you, they will do that. They're not gonna, they're not gonna pester you. They're not gonna try to fix you. They're not gonna try to answer all your problems. They're just gonna be with you in this relationship with God. And we need each other to do that, right? It's the Holy Spirit even more. Even more in your presence. Come fall on us. Come meet us. Come speak to all those places of despair. I feel like there's somebody in here you've been, you've been trying to medicate and not through drugs or alcohol, but through, through distractions. Maybe it's a binge watching a show, or maybe it's a, I don't know what it is. I, anyhow, I just want to encourage you that the Lord says, I see you, and I have a better way for you. Come lean into me. The distractions aren't bad. 
about life with me first. So come, Lord, even more in your presence, even more in your spirit. Speak your life and your hope to each of us as we worship.